The verse is from Galatians, verse 2, uh, 6 through 14. And from those who supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised. For he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized that grace had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They all ask only one thing, that we, we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self Condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision factor, faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Before we continue, I have to ask, how many are are for the chiefs? Wow, and how many are for San Francisco? How many for Taylor Swift? (laughs) You know, sports is a really good uh, reminder for us that we can be on opposing sides. And the beautiful thing about sports is when it's done well, uh, you can razz each other and all that kind of stuff. But at the end, you're just enjoying the game. And you win or lose, you know, like like I say, when it's done well, you still get get along and everything like that. Faith is very similar to this. When it's done well, we can all get along, but there are times when we don't. Uh, This is part of a letter that we have been continuing on. It's Paul's letter to the Galatians. It's one of the the first letters that we have, and so it really kind of delves and gives us a window into the very early parts of the, the early church. And Paul is getting a little snarky at this one. Uh, He starts this sentence, bless you, my goodness, but this, you okay? All right, okay, because you're interrupting, so it's, <laughs> you I just ignore, but you know, the, um, it's, he, he has an urgency because this big argument that they're having is whether or not people that are from the outside, they were known as pagans at this time, could be welcomed into the church of Christ. Now, Jesus at this time, was this, was, this whole thing was a Jewish faith. And so a lot of people felt that in order to be part of the Christian circle, which was a Jewish thing, you should become Jewish, meaning you should follow the traditions and also, most importantly, you should be circumcised. This is the most important faction here, and this is why Paul is stressing this by saying instead of Gentiles and Jews, he's talking about circumcised and uncircumcised, because to him, this argument is so futile, and then when people try to argue that, he's getting livid about that. And so he shows, throws this opening volley here in this, uh, this uh, part of the letter here by saying the, the original apostles they mean nothing to me. They have not, I've not learned a thing from them. They, the, what, they, uh, what I learned came from Christ, the same as what they learned came from Christ. And he's walking this fine line because if he, uh, his critics right now are saying, 
he's just a follower of the apostles and he's gotten some information wrong because he says that the, the, the pagans can be welcomed without being circumcised. He's gotten that part wrong. He's just a student of the apostles. And so he has to make the argument that he's not a student of the apostles. And he also has to make the argument that they're, he's friends with the apostles. He's, but Paul, God bless him, sometimes he says stuff, you know, that if he were married, the ride home would be, there would be a lecture from a wife saying, you know, I'm not sure, you, you kind of, yeah, you just kind of need to know when to shut up. And that's what's happening with the apostles. He's in this uh, trip here to Jerusalem, and they're starting to debate this, and they're starting to have these, these little frictions. For all of us to think that, that, that the, the first church just, you know, Jesus did this thing, and he did, and he went away, and, and we were just all singing, and, and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. There was argument. There was a way that we had to fight it out to get to where we are today. And that's what's happening here. It's one of the first big arguments of whether or not pagans should be allowed. And if they are allowed, should they follow Jewish law on this? Now, a lot of the people that Paul is talking to, the early disciples, were just like Paul. They were born Jewish. They were part of this for life. And all their life, they have been taught that following the Torah, the law of Moses, following this is the way that you honor God. They did not think of themselves as free of sin, but they did think of themselves as the ones that were chosen by God. And you honored that by following those laws. That's how you stayed in God's good grace, is by following all of those laws, traditions. And your identity, if you were a male, was to be circumcised. It was very, very important. It was not just a thing of an elite group. This was how you worshiped. And so for them to welcome other people, it was... It was a difficult thing. Other groups of people didn't do a whole lot of mixing, especially when it came to faith at this time. What's happening in the world at this time is radical. It is different. Paul is calling on other people of other lineage, other cultures to come and be part of this. And this is something that has just never been done. There's been people that have been from the pagan world that have joined Judas, but they've become Jewish. They have become that. They have followed everything. Circumcision, the laws, the Torah, everything. Paul is saying that the only requirement is that they accept Christ as their Savior. Uh, he also says, you know, that his way of accepting Christ is by, uh, through baptism and through sharing the communion together. Uh, you know, practicing that. And that also means giving up some of your pagan ways. Now, the pagans at this time, some of the pagans, the, some of the worship practices were considered highly immoral. And some of them, even today's standards, are considered highly immoral practices. And so if you were a Jewish person growing up in the first century, and even before that, you were constantly told that in order to honor God was to follow those laws, Right? The way to disrespect God is to mingle with people that weren't following those laws. And so the Jewish people, to them, pagans, were not only uh, dirty, not only the scum of the earth, they were sin. They were the illustration of sin. And so if you are living your life to honor God, you don't go and just have a dinner with people that aren't that are doing things that are immoral and icky. And so if you were a Jewish person, you did, not, you did not hang out with these guys. You were taught from childhood on, these were not the ones that you wanted to hang out with. As a matter of fact, if you had to go from point A to point B and you, the town was mostly pagan, you were encouraged to go around it, or if you had to go through it, you were encouraged to do a symbolic wiping the dust off your shoes so that you would take no part of this pagan world with you in your travels. Now imagine that that is important. That, that is the biggest warning. This is a time when people are still worried about upsetting God. And so this radicalness of Paul saying, let's let him in, is very hard for anybody to comprehend. And so it's not about an elite group type of thing. It's really about a worshiping God type of thing and having a little bit of confusion in that. 
And what Paul's argument is, is that I'm not, this is not a, just a difference here. This is God calling us to do this. God is calling me. The same God that called you to do this stuff is calling me to do this stuff. So he marches into Jerusalem and he has words with these guys. James, John, Peter, who he calls Cephas. Cephas is Aramaic for the rock. We don't know why. Uh, it's funny that Paul actually, the, only the, uh, the very few Aramaic words that he uses, he's calling Peter by his Aramaic name. And we don't know exactly what that, if that's a dig at some kind, because he's getting a little bit snarky here. Like, the snarky is the best word that I can uh, say without really swearing. But he's, you know, he's getting kind of testy at this. And there is an argument there. And Paul's this kind of guy that will just sit there and he will tell you what he feels and darn it, you're gonna listen to it. And he's gonna just have this debate with you and he's not gonna give up. And the disciples, the early disciples, you can almost just see them getting exhausted by Paul and just saying, geez, Paul, come on, all right, fine. We, we understand that you are called by God, the same God that we are. Let's have a compromise. You go... <laughs> That was their, I think that was their, their biggest plug. You just go, uh, but go and you preach to the pagans, we'll stay and preach to the Jews. Now, a lot of people think that this is a dividing line. They think that this is where uh, people said black and white, this is, we're going to do this, you're going to do this. But stories in like Acts and things like that tell us that that's not the case. There was some gray to it. Paul was known for going to synagogues before he ever went to the pagans and all of that kind of stuff. It was more of a geographical thing. We want to make this a villain-villain kind of thing, but it really was, they were saying, Paul, the regions that you are, are preaching in, living and breathing in, are mostly pagan territory. Preach to them. Let them know about Jesus. We who are in Jerusalem, we are surrounded by a population of Jewish folks that are still trying to comprehend that Christ was this chosen one, this Messiah. We will preach to them. And so it was a team effort to go. Now, that being said, there were still moments of friction. There's still moments where Christian against Christian didn't get along too well. And we see this in Antioch. Antioch was a wonderful uh, example of this new thing that was happening. In Antioch, the way that Paul describes it, a room such as this, where people of different, different worlds, different ways, there was the pagans, there was the Jews, and they were all sharing worship together. Again, this is radical at this time. This is something that just didn't happen at this time. So if you were to walk in in the first century and see this, it would blow your mind. And Peter was among them. At this time, Peter is with the, the pagans, the Gentiles. He's mingling with them. He's, he's, he's understanding this because Peter, not too long ago, had a vision himself to baptize some Gentiles. So he does see that this is important. He does understand this, but they're still trying to get down to the nitty-gritty and the, just, the logistics of what we do here and how we do it. And Paul's enjoying this. He's seen the, 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 the cornerstone of the faith, Peter, Cephas, the rock, and he is sharing worship with pagans. To him, this is ideal. This is the moment that he has been called for because to, for him, the moment to be called for, his calling here is to spread that gospel beyond the Jewish gates and go everywhere and tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. But then something happens. There's friends of James that come in. Now James, the brother of Jesus, was now the, the leader at this time, the leader of the church. And in some cases, he was the rule maker. And some of this stuff with the circumcision and all of this kind of stuff was still a hot topic. And so as soon as the, the, this, this group that Peter kind of belongs to enters this room, everything changes. Peter gets up and he goes and says, I'm sorry, I'm, I, gotta, I gotta go over with these guys. And before we know it, that room divides. The followers of Peter, join him. E even, even people that were with Paul 
friends of Paul. He can't believe his eyes. What was once this utopian message of God's love is now being divided. And on this side of the room, we have pagans. And on this side of the room, we have Jewish people. But yet everybody in the building is there to worship Jesus Christ. And Paul's argument on this is very stern. He calls Peter in front of everybody and says, Peter, what are you doing? Just a moment ago, you were living as a Gentile, and yet you are still a Jew. Why are you telling the Gentiles that they have to live as Jews and can't be who they are when you are who you are? Funny thing, this meal that they're talking about, uh, you know, we always, we always think of it as, you know, uh, everyone's got their own Dixie cup and, you know, they're, they're, there's a buffet line, you know, and they've got the plates with the little, you know, carvings out and they've got the, the Jello mold and everything like that. And they had Jello. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't. This was worship, which means the eating together was communion. It was communion that they were sharing. This is why Paul is so angry. Because when we share communion, we share the body of Christ. And back then, back then, they did it the way that many of you might have done it before in, in, in different denominations and stuff. You take one loaf of bread, you peel and you share it. One cup, you pass it along. Everybody takes a drink. This is a group of people the Jews, they were told all their life that the pagans are disgusting. And they are asked to share this meal with them now. And that's the barrier that Paul is trying to tell them is that these guys are welcomed in. And Peter was in agreement of that, but then, this is going to be so hard to explain because it is so beyond what we understand these days, but I'm hoping that we can grasp it. Every once in a while back then, a Christian would play into politics. You know? I know that's hard for us to believe now, that a Christian would be part of politics and that that would mix. But it happened. Peter, when he, when he does this thing, Paul is not accusing him. He's accusing him of hypocrisy. He's accusing him of being two-faced. But most importantly, he's accusing him of being a politician now. Because Paul sees Peter, who is playing to this crowd, but as soon as his crowd comes in, he plays to them. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but every once in a while, a politician will just play to a certain group, They'll just play to, like, the, their voters. This is what's happening 2,000 years ago. Peter is trying to play favorites with the people that are in his immediate circle, his demographic. And he doesn't want to rock the boat by letting them see him eating with them. Now, Peter, God bless him, I love Peter because he tells us how to be human because throughout history of all of the apostles, he has more of these incidences where he is just completely screwed up and he's called on it. He was sitting and eating with people. And what, G what Paul's argument here is, is that when Jesus, we're going to be celebrating Easter here pretty soon, when Jesus rose from the dead, Sins were cleaned. We were forgiven. We were no longer seen as slaves to sin. We were seen as God's creation and part of that kingdom movement, and we were free of those, those persecutions, those labels. And what Paul is saying is that if you are denying them if you are still saying that they are sin, you are downplaying the very resurrection of Christ because Christ swept through and forgave 
and here is a room of people that are accepting and believing in Christ, and you are still telling them that they are not forgiven. That's why Paul is so livid about this. It's not a social experiment. It's not about being a polite dinner. It's about sharing the body of Christ. And Paul says, you cannot separate that. Because if you separate that, you are downplaying the significance of it. By saying that these guys who have given up their pagan lifestyle, who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, they, by doing that, are part of the family of Abraham, and you just have to accept that. Because they are all the body of Christ. And this is going to continue to be an argument. This is going to continue to be something. But what I want to point out is, is that this argument was happening 2,000 years ago about circumcision. But the shameful thing is, the rotten thing is, is that we can make this argument today over a wide variety of things. It's not just one thing for us anymore. It's what political side are you on? It's who do you vote for? It's what side of town are you on? It's what color of skin you are. It's what culture you are. It's what lifestyle you have. It's all of that stuff. We find ways to divide ourselves. We find our ways as Christ believers to still separate the body of Christ. Paul's letter yelling at those early apostles is Paul's letter today yelling at us. He's saying to us a message over 2,000 years ago. You were calling yourself a Christian. Why aren't you acting like it? Because if you're a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, that means that we are supposed to emulate the teachings of Christ. If we are truly that, then the person sitting in the room with us should not be divided. It should be our neighbor. Then the person that even if we have differences... We have a commonality, and that is that Christ died for us, and Christ rose for us. And to Paul, remember, to him it is vital, because to him we once lived where we were slaves of sin. And in the future is the second coming of Christ where the kingdom will be built on earth. And we are in the middle, in this kind of overlapping world here. And our job as Christians, as ambassadors to that mission, is to lead people to that kingdom and to live as Christians, no longer slaves to sin. That includes the Jews. That includes the pagans. It also includes the Democrats, the Republicans, the gay, the straight, whatever label you want to give, the black, the white, poor, rich, Whatever label that you want to go on there, it includes us all. And the hardest part for us is to live like it. We are in a, a year that is going to be rocky. Uh, our politics have become our church in many ways. And we have uh, divided ourselves. And it continues to bubble and then it, it's going to boil over again as we get toward another election. My challenge, I vote for who you want, but love. Do not let our division be our church. Let God be our church. It's very hard. When you start out every day, love God, love yourself, love your, love your neighbor, it's very hard to go out there and hate someone. Let that be what we repeat every day. Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. And let's work toward, toward that peace. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we have division, we have, di we have divisiveness, and we want to solve it by just yelling and hating each other. Help remind us that we are part of your kingdom. We are part of your message. We are, we are part of you. Help us to love as you love. Help us to invite as you invite. Help us to welcome as you welcome. And help us to live in unity 
as you call us to live. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen.